Great to have you back and welcome to next few lessons in waves that really have an impact on our lives. So what we'll study today are longitudinal waves of which sound waves are probably the most important. Well, before we dive into this, I'd like you to press the subscribe button so that you can continue getting notifications on all new videos from me. So far, we have described mechanical waves more in terms of displacement and confined our discussion to transverse waves only. But there's another type of mechanical wave that we call longitudinal wave and sound wave is an example of it. Fortunately, the mathematical treatment of longitudinal waves is quite the same as that of transverse waves or simply put the longitudinal waves will have pretty much the same equations to describe the motion as we used in transverse waves nevertheless let us understand the physical nature of longitudinal waves a little deeper so the difference between transverse waves and longitudinal waves is that in transverse waves the vibrations are along the y-axis or perpendicular to the direction of propagation of the wave well in longitudinal waves the direction of vibrations is parallel to the direction of propagation of waves so you can see here the molecules of the air are moving back and forth along the x-axis that is also the direction of propagation or the movement of the wave and well if we zoom into say one layer of this longitudinal wave what we'll see is the molecules of the air or the medium is moving back and forth like this about an equilibrium position now the other difference between transverse and longitudinal waves is that when we deal with longitudinal waves and particularly sound waves, a more useful discussion can happen if we describe them in terms of pressure fluctuations, probably because our ears are more receptive to pressure change and therefore longitudinal waves, sound waves being one of them, pressure fluctuations come into the picture. Well, we will learn more about it in subsequent lessons. So let us start with some simple ideas that we'll use in next couple of lessons. So what we have here is point S, which is a small sound source, often termed point source. Its job is largely to emit sound waves in all directions and the concentric circles are what we call wave fronts and these rays that you see indicate the direction in which the sound waves travel. Now, wave fronts are actually surfaces over which the vibrations due to sound wave have the same value. So these are represented by partial circles or full circles when we make two dimensional drawings for a point source. Now, rays are lines that are always perpendicular to the wave fronts and they actually indicate the direction of travel of the wave fronts. The small double arrows on the rays indicates the longitudinal oscillations of the medium, say molecules in the air and these, these double arrows are always parallel to the rays. So what you can see is that near a point source, the wave fronts are spherical and they actually spread out in three dimension and and when the wave front moves outwards, the radii becomes larger and so the curvature reduces. So when we deal with numerical problems for wave fronts that are far from the source, we say that the wave fronts are planes and waves are said to be planar. Well, if the analysis is happening in two dimension, the, the far off waves are represented by straight lines. So let us go ahead and understand the speed of sound and how it can vary in various mediums. So in the earlier lessons, we learned that the speed of any wave, transverse or longitudinal, is a function of one, the inertial property, or simply put, mass density of the medium in which the wave is propagating. And you'll recall that this property enables storage of kinetic energy. And two, 
the speed of the wave depends on the elastic property of the medium and that is where potential energy gets stored. So if you refer to earlier lesson, we can have an equation that gives us the generalized version of the speed of transverse wave along a straight string and this could be v is equal to under root of tau upon mu which in turn is equal to the under root of elastic property divided by the inertial property of the medium and well we know when we deal with transverse waves tau is nothing but tension t in the string and mu is mass per unit length of the string or very often called linear density well if the medium is air and the wave is longitudinal we can guess that the inertial property of mu is the density of the air but what would be the elastic property that substitutes tension t in a string well as a sound wave passes through air potential energy shows up in the periodic compression and expansion of air and the property that determines the limits to which the element of a medium changes in volume when pressure is changed is called the bulk modulus b and mathematically it is written as b is equal to minus delta p upon delta capital v upon v so let me go ahead and write this so here delta p is the change in pressure on say a section of air and delta v is the corresponding change in volume of air due to the pressure and capital v is the original volume when there is no pressure applied or you could say that delta v upon capital v is a fractional change in volume well you can see that bulk modulus has the units of pressure or pascal because the denominator is a fraction so if positive pressure is applied the volume will decrease and therefore the denominator will become negative but since we have a minus sign here b will yield a positive quantity likewise if you reduce pressure that is delta p is negative delta v will be positive since it would have increased and again b will be positive in fact the reason a negative sign appears in this equation is to keep b positive so putting b in the equation for velocity and rho for mu what we get is velocity of sound can be written as v is equal to under root b upon rho so here we have a tabulation of velocity of sound in various mediums so if you pause the video here what you'll observe is that the density of water is about thousand times greater than that of air and if density was the only factor the speed of sound in water would be significantly less than the speed in air but it's actually just the reverse speed of sound is more in water than air well this is only possible if speed is as much dependent on bulk modulus of water which is actually more than thousand times higher than that of air in in other words water is a lot less compressible than air that is for a given pressure change on water the fractional change in volume that is this quantity is much lower making b much large so while you can use this formula to solve a lot of numerical problems i feel a lot more clarity will come to you if you also learn the derivation of this formula so let's go ahead and derive it and i think you'll feel more confident when you approach numerical problems after seeing the derivation so stay with me so let us take a tube through which we'll send a single pulse by compressing air from right to left so here is the tube and let's create a pulse on the extreme right so this pulse is nothing but a burst of air that has got compressed because of the pressure we applied at this end so what has happened is that in this section the molecules of air have come closer to each other and therefore there is more pressure in this section so when you apply pressure on the right hand side 
the pulse of compressed air will start moving with a speed v to the left and let me emphasize here that much like the transverse waves the medium which is air here itself is not moving forward but the molecules of air are pushing successive layers of molecules in front and sending the pulse ahead now if you actually run parallel to this pulse with the same speed v as this pulse the pulse will look stationary to you and since you're running from right to left in this reference frame it will appear as if the air in the tube is running at speed v from left to right now assume the pressure of the air surrounding this pulse as p and the pressure inside the pulse as p plus delta p and it'll be p plus delta p due to the positive compression of the pulse if you take an air section of thickness delta x which is this so this thickness is let us say delta x then we can say that this section of thickness delta x and cross sectional area a is moving towards a pulse with a velocity v remember we are moving with the pulse so the pulse is stationary in our reference frame but the air ahead is moving towards you and the pulse with a velocity v so when this section of air reaches a pulse the front face of the section comes in contact with the pulse and naturally slows down due to positive or high pressure of the pulse so this is how the situation looks like that the section of thickness delta x has approached the pulse and the front face of this section is now interfacing with the pulse so let us say that this results in slowing down of the section to speed v plus delta v and delta v would obviously be a negative number so we say that the velocity v has slowed down to v plus delta v and we are saying that delta v is a negative number because we know that the velocity has reduced and that's the reason we are saying this is a negative number well this slowing down ends when the rear part of the air section that is this section enters a pulse too and let us say that this takes time delta t that is delta t is the time it takes between the front part of the air section touching the pulse to the time when the rear part of the section enters a pulse then we can say that delta t is equal to delta x upon v or essentially we are saying that the rear section had to travel a distance delta x at a velocity v to reach the pulse so you got to remember that all through the derivation the small v is velocity and capital v is the volume so if we apply newton's second law to this section of air during time delta t we can say the force on the rear section is p a or pressure into area because the pressure here is p and the cross sectional area is a then p into a is the force acting from this direction and the average force on the front face is p plus delta p into a pointing in this direction so we can say the average force acting on this acting on this section of air is equal to p a minus p plus delta p into a which equals minus delta p into a and let's go ahead and label this as net force and the negative sign indicates that the net force points to the left which is expected considering the high pressure from right hand side now if the volume of the section is v its mass can be written as delta m is equal to rho into the volume of the section which is equal to rho into the cross sectional area into its thickness and this therefore is equal to rho a v delta t so what we've done is we've substituted delta x from this equation as delta t into v over here and this is the mass of this section of air
Also, the average acceleration of this section is equal to the change in velocity over the time it takes for the change in velocity. So, we can say that the average acceleration for this section is equal to the change in velocity, which we assumed as delta V upon the time it takes, which is delta T. So, this becomes the acceleration of the system or the section of this air, which is rather deceleration. Then, if we apply Newton's second law of motion, which says that force is equal to the product of mass into acceleration, we can say that the force on this section of the air is minus delta P into A, which should equal to the mass, which we've calculated as rho A V delta T into its acceleration, which we've calculated as delta v upon delta t and if you rework this equation a little i'm not cancelling terms over here but i'll just go ahead and write the simplified version what you'll get is rho v square is equal to minus delta p divided by delta v upon v and remember this is not volume these are velocities now the air that occupies volume outside as V is equal to A into V. So we can say that the volume of the section when it was outside was V equal to the area of cross section into its velocity into delta T, which is calculated as air sweep of V meters per second multiplied by the time of sweep, which is delta T into the area of the cross section is compressed by delta V. So the compression of this air which was initially outside is delta V is equal to A into change in velocity into time which is delta T. And why delta V over here? Because earlier the air could sweep V meters per second and now it sweeps delta V meters per second less. So if you multiply delta T with delta V that must be the compression. So if we divide this equation by this, what we get is delta V upon V is equal to A delta V delta T upon A V delta T. And you can see that the terms cancel off over here. And what we get is this equals delta small V upon V. So if we substitute this, this expression over here, so instead of delta V upon V, we write capital delta V upon V. What we get is rho V square equals minus delta P upon delta V upon V. And we know from this equation over here that if you square both the sides, what you get is V square uh, is equal to B upon rho or B is equal to V square rho. And therefore, we can write V square rho for B. So we substitute V square rho for B. So B, we can say, is equal to minus delta P upon delta V upon V and that's exactly what we want to do establish over here we had started with this as the definition of B and that's exactly what we have derived over here so my challenge question is what is the unit of bulk modulus is it Pascal is it Newton per meter square is it Pascal per meter cube or it is dimensionless. Write your answer in the comments below and expect to hear from me. So if you like this video, go ahead and give it a thumbs up and please do not forget to subscribe to this channel for many more interesting videos.